Stanford University. This is our panel about so how do we start doing this stuff? You know, what is it it takes to operationalize some of these, these big trends or how do we shift protein on the plate? And um, we're the only thing that stands between this crowd and hearing Shirley speak. Well, we better get moving. So let's get on with it. Um, again, just, you know, I, I'm really into reprise, as a, you know, especially when you're doing theater and performance. So <laughs> this guy's a Stanford alum. Uh, in a few generations, we moved from being underfed to overfed. Um, and as Christopher shared with us, um, as a nation, we now consume perhaps twice as much protein as most people need. That's a lot of protein. Um, and we keep being offered more and eating more. And Christopher and I did not coordinate presentations. I started to eat Cheerios again when I saw that it was protein. And it looks like it's chocolate protein yeah, also from the, the color <laughs> That's of the even top. better protein. Even better. Yeah. Um, we looked at the protein per capita protein intake earlier and um, how growing all of that food for animals so we could eat food was a way in which we transformed how we planted the planet. And I really think that Herbert Hoover did a, an amazing job, except he didn't get chickens the vote. That's right. That was the one shortcoming in his whole scheme. <laughs> but um, growing that much food, uh, for eating that many animals means that we have to grow a lot of uh, stuff to feed animals. And uh, the agricultural impact of different types of proteins are very, very different, as are the health impacts. And although we're not going to talk about it because of things like climate change, floods, and drought, animals that eat commodities that are traded every day and have their price change every day also not only concentrate that environmental impact, they also concentrate some of the price volatility, which matters a lot to food service operators. So we all know that this audience likes pie mm, um, more, more than everyone pie. else. <laughs> but what we have learned, because we started to take a little bit of a look at Stanford, is that Stanford seems to like chicken pie. The chicken a lot. pot pie chart. Yes. Like so, it. you know, we've done a couple things together. I'm going to put it out there and then ask you, you know, so, so what do you think or where are we going next? And yeah. pass this clicker over to Eric. Is, so at Stanford, one of the things we looked at is in terms of protein and especially the foods we think of as traditionally protein-rich foods, whether that's red meats or poultry or beans or soy um, products, you know, how is Stanford's consumption of protein compared to what we need? and what we eat as a nation. And Stanford has a pretty favorable mix. Um, if we think about environmental impact, people at Stanford, students at Stanford, not only like pie, they like chicken pie. And not only do they like chicken pie, they like chicken. And we get about twice as much of our, chick our protein at Stanford from chicken when we eat in the dining hall as the rest of the country does. Um, Plant-based proteins, about the same as a, as a proportion. We're still doing some analysis around how much protein uh, we're feeding Stanford students. Right. Um, we don't eat in the dining hall all the time. Some of us are eating 10 meals or 14 meals, depending right. on the program we select. We don't always show up for all the meals. We don't know right. if the rest of those meals are dining out at other eating establishments or mostly the fermented beverages that Christopher's going to talk about later this right. afternoon. <laughs> yeah. But a meal at Stanford is a very protein-rich meal, and that protein-rich meal is a very chicken-rich meal. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, Shandon, you're doing some things to try and shift that already to a plant-based piece. Um, and Eric, I thought you might want to talk a little bit first about the uh, protein project we have underway. And yeah, and so, see so uh, Arlen and, uh, and oh, sorry. started working we'll with click. us. Click over those things. Uh, a they couple don't months ago, and what we really are looking at is how do we how do we look at our proteins? Uh, what exactly we're buying? What are we serving to students? How can we improve it? Both from a, you know, you can put it into the bucket of health and wellness and and what we're serving, but really the impact to the environment as well. So how can we have higher quality uh, proteins that are also more sustainable and and really have a, a strategy associated with that? So we've do done a lot of. Uh, uh, collectively data mining and looking at what are our purchasing practices and, and also how can we, uh, uh, because we're in a, a university environment, how can we have a predictor that's more even around cost management and, and buying and sourcing of proteins because again, we're buying in very large quantities and when we make shifts, they tend to have larger impacts. So, uh, we want to be careful and thoughtful about them in terms of what the uh, meal plan price also would be for costs for students and for their parents. 
Shannon, um, we're going to skip those things. Tell me a little bit about what's going on in the dining hall today. Okay. So, um, you know, we, I think the chefs did an outstanding job last year. The food program that we had was, was incredible. But the uh, instructions to them this year was, we're not doing what we did last year. Yeah. We're going to do something different this year. With uh, an intentional uh, focus on developing um, more delicious uh, vegan, vegetarian offerings, I think we do a great job when it comes to, you know, doing the animal proteins. But can the chefs innovate and, and be creative around creating uh, really delicious um, offerings with, with, uh, with vegetables and uh, working with different types of meat analogs, uh, maybe like garden or, um, or tofu. So if you go into the dining hall today and you look at what I'll call our performance bar, which is essentially a salad bar, um, one of the things that we've added this year is we have a, you know, a stainless steel mixing bowl, which you know Chef Adam spoke about earlier today when he was doing his demo that one of the things he dislikes about going through a salad bar is you put all these delicious fresh ingredients in there, um, well, on a plate, right? And you, you have your dressing sitting on top. So we've kind of fixed that. So we're giving the students a bowl. They can put all these delicious vegetables, um, add their dressing, and if they want, they could add chicken to that or they could add another meat offering that we have there and, uh, and go ahead and, and mix that salad up to eat. Now, um, first of all, just whoever's in the back, I was hoping that we could click back to another slide for Eric, um, but I'm having a hard time making that work if Eric wants to use it. Yeah, <laughs> I was okay. going to pass there. So I was not. just going to add on to what Jen is saying. So from a, a, a purchasing standpoint, though, we also so we uh, uh, started working with Pie Ranch, Jared, uh, this year. But we have to think about that in a different way. So we are buying a large quantity again. So we cannot just simply say to one farmer, by the way, uh, grow all this product for us and you have to assume all of the expenses and costs associated with that for the next growing season. So what we've done is actually we pay it forward. So not only are we saying, oh, Pie Ranch, this is what we'd like, we wanna buy your baby kale and, and some other things that you're growing, but we're gonna actually pay you for that full year of growing season. And so that way it helps them to really, if you think about the whole sustainability model, sustain their business practice as well. And, uh, and that's fairly unique, and it's something we want to try to develop also with other universities. Well, how can you do that? Because the financial impact uh, uh, is great for small farmers, and we all say, let's work with more small farmers, but we want to be able to say, sustain their business also. Yeah. Now, I know you this past year, I, I heard from your, your purchasing team, made a, the same decision that Chipotle did, yes. which was to source a lot of your beef from yeah. Australia, yeah. which is an interesting move. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk so, about Sure. That? So this past year, um, uh, we started looking at uh, focusing on beef really as a category and how we can improve our beef purchasing, what was our mix of uh, beef that we were using, and where were we getting it from, and, and having a really uh, a strong strategy around that. And so we started looking locally what we can do. That's very tricky, actually, to try to buy beef locally in, in California, especially Northern California. Produce is obviously easier for us. Uh, we started looking at the nation, and uh, there's a lot of uh, things that are happening in the cattle industry, number one. But number two is that we started to look outside the U.S. and said, well, really, let's think about this. Is it more important for us to just buy because somebody is next door and think about whether this is, uh, Food Miles is the most important decision maker, or can we find a supplier who actually has better sustainable growing practices, can transport it, which they do by barge, so it's sustainably shipped, and, uh, and it's all grass-fed, and we can actually serve grass-fed beef entirely. So all the beef that we would have, which would be cost prohibitive for us uh, typically, uh, we buy now from, and source from Australia. And uh, so that's throughout the system, and Chipotle actually is doing that as well. It's very difficult to buy sustainably raised beef in the U.S., and, uh, and so we found a good partner actually that way, which is a different, and we actually got some criticism for doing that as well. It's a, it's a really interesting thing. And, you know, I know there's a lot of push to, to source locally um, or regionally. And it's an interesting uh, choice we face because the growing seasons under climate change get to be a little less predictable. We've seen the U.S. Right. cattle industry really um, suffer and basically be able to produce less beef 
at a much higher cost because yeah. the corn and the soy and the hay aren't coming in right. like they do every year. Right. Uh, but when we look at that the environmental impact is largely on the production or the growing side, moving to a place that produces really well makes a lot of sense unless we're willing to start changing what it is we put on the plate to match what comes up. Yeah. Now, going back, Chandon, to, to some of the things that you're doing at the same time that Stanford's trying to source beef that's raised more responsibly, you also were telling me that you've started to um, rethink how you're cooking some of the, the, the plant al alternatives like tofu. Right. And what's happened with your use of beef and pork and chicken and also those plant-based proteins once you put them out and they look more attractive? and taste better. Yeah, that, you're right. Yeah, we definitely, uh, I mean, to, to talk to the uh, tofu piece, um, you know, our, our chefs actually kind of looked at how we were producing, how we were cooking tofu. And, and to be honest with you, it wasn't really very exciting. You had these little cubes of tofu that, you know, were laden with some delicious sauce, what have you. But the, it, the experience of eating that tofu wasn't that great. So we had these amazing uh, uh, vac machines in our kitchens. And uh, we realized that when we put a, a dry marinade or a wet rub on, or a wet rub uh, marinade on the tofu and put it inside that vacuum seal, and then we marinated in there, <laughs> and then we baked it. At, well, at, you know, you let it marinate for a little bit, take it out of the bag, and then bake it. The, the result was amazing. The flavor was incredible. It looked appealing. Um, and uh, it, it was it was wonderful. It's, it's great. So so changing tofu our process. consumption is doing what this. So what? so we looked at we did a we we just have looked at some preliminary numbers. Our overall animal protein uh, consumption. This is comparing uh, uh, last month year over year. It's down twenty four percent, and but our plant uh, uh, purchasing is actually up almost fifteen percent. So yeah. so we've seen really a reversal, and I I do think it's a credit to. And, and, and uh, Greg was talking about this. The chefs play an integral role in making the food taste and look great because you eat with your eyes and no matter what it is, if it doesn't taste good, no one's gonna come back and, and wanna eat that. We also think about it in terms of the design of our facilities though and how to lay them out so that students will have a, a they'll make those choices uh, as well and, and, and help them try to eat kind of that more plant-centric diet first by how they, they go through the dining halls. I, uh, I think this is you know, a really remarkable way to look at the dining design, the plating design, and, and the menu and recipe design with what you did to take a little moisture out of the tofu, make it taste, taste better. As, as Greg mentioned also, of course, you cut it in triangles sometimes instead of uh, cubes, right. plus the dining design so that you're encountering the performance bar yeah. and some of the um, protein-rich salads um, and other choices before you get to the grilled chicken yeah. breast. Yeah which remains very popular, as we yeah. know. Um, yes. We have about a minute left, and I just want to ask Shandon and, and Eric if either you want to talk a little bit about what's next in terms of uh, the strategy for Stanford Dining before we bring Shirley up. So I, I would say overall our strategy is to really look at the carbon footprint of our, of our menu and to really see uh, what is our total carbon footprint as we're making, you know, currently and as we make in the, these changes, to really be able to show those data points and say by doing X, it's actually equaling this outcome. So currently we measure it in terms of our building and our facilities, how much, what is our carbon footprint of uh, water usage or, or all the things associated with operating a facility, but I wanna tie that actually into all of the production we have and I think capturing the food waste is a key component of that as well. So, so looking at what is that, that uh, Stanford University's kind of carbon yeah. footprint from what's happening in the dining halls. Yeah. I know we did a, a... And we need some student help on that. Yeah. So if you're interested, please. <laughs> yeah. And we did a meeting uh, last week with the uh, Chief Sustainability Officer for Stanford as well. And I think it was a bit eye-opening all around to think about how much farming, food choices, and kitchen operations contribute to Stanford's uh, climate change commitments as well. Um, with that, I think we're going to bring Christopher back up. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.